Hello and welcome to the Dorkamotive Podcast with Brian Loans. On this episode, we celebrate horsepower, gumption, and American ingenuity by looking back at Operation Highball, a land clearing operation in the western United States that completely remade the way human beings reshaped the earth for their own purposes. This is the story of a couple guys, a couple of bulldozers, and a lot of really interesting thinking. Mow down a forest like it was a field of wheat? Not even the legendary Paul Bunyan could do that. But wait, up in northern Montana, a couple of ingenious engineer contractors have built mowing machines that slash through timber just the way a threshing machine moves through a grain field. Trees 100 and 150 feet tall topple like straws. Between breakfast and lunch, two men and their equipment can mow down as much as 100 acres of virgin forest, and then the clanking, roaring, stacking cats move in and rake the fallen trees into windrows. The opening paragraph of a popular mechanic story from the August 1950 issue called Bowling Down Forests for a Super Dam. And that's exactly what this episode is going to be about. It's a, as I mentioned in the open of the show, this was something called Operation Highball. And we're going to get to all of that as we tell this really interesting story. And it's not, you know, a, a Broadway Freddy style story where there's, you know, murder and deception and all kinds of stuff. This is legitimately a story of really smart thinking of guys that uh, came up with a method of doing something no one had ever conceived before. And that method was then later used and continues to be used all around the world for different purposes. So if, you, if you're someone who loves trees, uh, this is probably not the show you you're going to want to listen to because this show is all about how to get trees out of the way trees that are in the way trees that need to be gone from a particular area of where these guys and where this process was taking place land clearing is something that human beings have done since the dawn of time we have cleared land for farming we have cleared land for roadways we have cleared land for building cities uh, we have dug things like the Panama Canal. So reshaping the earth is something that human beings have done since our you know, earliest days of being able to you know, plant seeds and you know, kick rocks around at each other when we were still you know, cavemen. So when we talk about 1950 being a time when people have come up with a revolutionary, a revolutionary idea on how to best do this, it's kind of funny because what could people not have thought of before 1950 to actually clear land? And that's what this story is all about. Innovation, invention, and a spirit in a time in the United States when things were really going about as good as anybody could have ever imagined. Just at the end of World War II is when this story is set. We are uh, at the late 1940s, heading into 1950. The, the economy is booming. People are back from the war. Uh, it is a very good time to be in the United States. So during World War II and during the the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we know that there were a lot of projects, there were a lot of administrations, there was a lot of work that was done to help bring the country first out of the depression and then to modernize the country to electrify parts of the country that were yet to be electrified even at that part and even at that time in history. So a lot of the electrification would come through the building of hydroelectric dams using the uh, power of water to spin turbines. The turbines then, of course, make the electricity, bada bing, bada boom, and now we have indoor electricity and we have people that never had electricity before lighting their homes and living uh, in what we would consider to be a modern way. So when we get up to this project, we're talking about Montana. We're talking about an area about 20 miles northeast of Kalispell, Montana, which uh, as of right now in 2020 has a population of just 20,000 people. This is a city that if we can picture Montana, you know, it's kind of a long state. It's a very long state left to right. This would be a city that is in the upper left-hand corner of Montana, not too far from the Canadian border. And if it has a population of 20,000 in the year 2020, one can only imagine what the population was in the late 40s or early 1950s. So a project was proposed, a dam was to be built, about, again in this area, about 20 miles northeast of Kalispell, and it was going to be used for uh, river flood control and, of course, to generate hydroelectric power. The government signs the paperwork to, to start this project or to, to justify this project in 1944. So it was actually before the war ended, this dam was proposed, and the completion date was proposed to be 1953. So about a 10-year process. And this was no small dam. This is, uh, even to this day, it is one of the largest dams in the world. At the time it was built, um, it was the third largest and the second tallest dam that had ever been constructed on Earth. Uh, 564 feet tall, 
Uh, it still is in the top 10 of the highest dams in the world. And uh, it is something when you talk about the size and scope of a project like this and the construction of the dam, um, they use 3.1 million cubic yards of concrete to build this thing, which is in gallons. You know, we think about what are cubic yards. You know, it's kind of a difficult thing to conceive if you're not someone that's bought material before or dealt in, you know, having a concrete slab poured. How do we convert that into a number that's even more ridiculous, but maybe more relatable? Well, what if we kind of took that 3.1 million cubic yards and transferred it into gallons? Because we all know what a gallon looks like. We all know what a gallon jug of milk looks like. So they use 626 million gallons of concrete to build this dam. 626 million gallons of concrete to build what was known as the Hungry Horse Dam, what still is known as the Hungry Horse Dam. It's one of the tallest dams also above sea level as well. It's 3,560 feet above sea level, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about. Um, you're up there in Montana, just west of the mountain range, and it is uh, it is an, an amazing thing to look at. I've never seen it in person. Uh, through the course of my research for this podcast, I've looked at a ton of photos, and you can drive across the top of it like you can with pretty much every major dam out there. It serves as a bridge as well, and it is an incredible feat. So June 5th, 1944, we authorized construction of the Hungry Horse Dam, and then things really start to uh, to crank along in 1947-1948. Obviously, with the concerns of the war and then the, the immediate post-war, getting everybody home and stuff, there was a lot of government concentration on that part of life as opposed to the project. So April of 1948... Uh, a $43.4 million contract is awarded to a company to actually construct the dam. Now, when you build the dam, you're obviously going to create a reservoir. And this reservoir they're going to create is very, very large. Um, about a 35 square mile lake is going to be created behind this Hungry Horse Dam. This is all kind of virginal territory. No one's ever been in there. There's been some logging on it. But you're talking about a 35 square mile area that needs to be stripped clean of everything. It does not. It cannot have trees. It cannot have vegetation. It can't have any of that stuff because you're going to have problems if you just leave all the trees and stuff there, and you flood this thing with water. Eventually, all those trees are going to are going to float out. They're going to rot. They're going to break, and all that stuff is going to head toward the dam because that's going to be the current flow, and it's going to cause major problems. They're going to start. You know, you're going to have trees blocking inlets for water. You're going to have all kinds of problems. So the building of the dam was one part of the project, but another huge part of it was the land clearing. And as you can imagine, uh, land clearing, uh, you know, if it's on flat ground, no big deal. But now we're talking about an area in Montana that's pretty, pretty rocky. It's got some ravines in it. You know, it's a very um, difficult place to operate and the very uneven terrain. Let's call it that. So when we start to talk about the land clearing um, and the scope of it, and then the timeline, because the, the, the dam is going to be built at the same time the land is being cleared. If you can picture this, you know, they're not going to just clear the land and then start building the dam. In order to maintain the project schedule here, they had to start building the dam as the land was going to be cleared. And that made it important for everybody to hit their timelines. It made it very important for people to make sure that they stayed on top of the work because if they didn't, you're going to have a dam that's done and the land's not cleared. That would be the nightmare scenario because then you can't actually flood the reservoir area. Then you have all kinds of problems. Um, if the land is cleared before the dam is done, perfect. That's actually great because then it can put you ahead of schedule on, on, a bunch of other, uh, on a bunch of other work. So when we talk about 35 square miles of trees, we're talking about 22,400 acres. Um, again, a massive, massive tract of land here. And to this point in American history, probably the largest land clearing job of this type that has ever been attempted, that has ever been contracted by the government. So you have to go in a couple of phases here. And the first is, you know, if you're going to cut down a forest in Montana, or you're going to remove effectively a forest in Montana there is some value in that before you just start going and wrecking the place there is value there is old growth trees that have never been touched in there so the government decided to contract several different uh, lumbering companies to go in through this land and pick out the good trees and cut them down and and make lumber of them um, 
you know, this was there was a lot of pine, there was a lot of larch, there was all kinds of different forms of trees inside this forest, and those trees were, as the term is, merchantable. They can be cut, they can be turned into lumber, they can be turned into railroad ties. And so that was the first part of this process, is the lumbering companies set up sawmills and brought in teams and teams of lumberjacks to go through this, this massive 35 square mile stretch and log as much of it as possible in order for them to make money. And the government, you know, obviously uh, the government saw this as a good opportunity to help the logging industry and everybody kind of made out of the end. It was smart business to do this. If you have a product that you can sell, you don't just want to go mangle it and not get anything back for it. So um, the railroad ties were among the most popular things that were cut out of these trees, and that's because the Great Northern Railroad was uh, still under construction at this point, some spurs of it. So the railroad ties were used uh, by the hundreds of thousands, if not more, as they were being cut out of these um, were being cut out of these forests. So about 1949-ish, the first cement begins to get poured at the dam. So 1949, the actual physical construction of the dam is, is starting. And they understand it's going to take about four years from that point to finish the job after that first bucket of concrete hits the ground. 1949 is also the time where the government just tells the lumber companies, all right, you guys have had your time. It's time now to finish up your work, get out of the way, and now the clearing operation has to begin. The difference between logging and land clearing Pretty simple. In logging, you're picking out the trees, you're milling them down, making two by fours, making floorboards, making railroad ties, you're making a product from the trees. For land clearing, you are simply in charge of getting rid of the trees by any means necessary. And this is a time in history and this booming part in America that maybe seem far well may might seem foreign mentally to some people in twenty twenty, but this was not an era where anybody was really thinking about what was going to happen to the spotted owls that lived in that forest or the, you know, the, the horn, the, the horny toads or whatever you call them, the, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. No one that this wasn't that era. This was, here's the job. The forest is a problem. We need to get rid of these trees because we're going to have a dam here. And it wasn't mired in 10 years of studies. It wasn't mired in red tape forever. This was the direction, this was the plan, and now it was time to hire people to execute the plan. And that's where the two main protagonists of this story enter in are two hardworking, very innovative, and very smart land clearing experts from Redding, California. Now it's time to meet them. So now is the time we learn about who the guys are that are really going to be the central part of this story. And their names are Red Wixen and J.H. Trisdale. They are out of Redding, California, and they are the kind of low bidder, if you will, for the one of the first major contracts on this Hungry Horse Dam project. Now, they're not the very first, though. The very first guy that was awarded a land-clearing contract on this job was a man named J.J. Reese, who was from Columbia Falls, Montana, and had a land-clearing business, and one of these guys that got way in over his head. And I tell this story only because it adds to the kind of scene that, that Wixen and Trisdale are able to uh, create for themselves and how they're able to dominate this project. So Reese comes in, gets a contract, and uh, the, the government documentation says this. Clearing of the reservoir site signaled the beginning of main construction work on the Hungry Horse project in 1947. The clearing process overlapped the construction time of the dam. Wixon and Trisdale of Redding, California, and J.J. Reese of Columbia Falls, Montana, received contracts to clear parts of the reservoir site in May of 1947. Reese began the work on his section June 23, 1947, but moved very slowly. He completed only a quarter of the scheduled work in more than half the time allowed by the contract. In August 1948, the Bureau of Reclamation terminated Reese's contract and Seaboard Surety Construction Company assumed the work under bond. Seaboard completed the work by the end of 1949, 125 days behind schedule. Now, Wixon and Crow started their work on September 7th of 1948. And the reason that Wixon and Crow did so well in the contracting process, and, and to be clear, Reese had a very small area to clear 
Wixon and Crow got one of the biggest contracts. They started out with several thousand acres to clear, where Reese was just trying to clear about a thousand acres, and he couldn't even do that on time. So knowing that they have this giant piece of land, you wonder how do they get the contract? Well, as we mentioned, and I mentioned a moment ago, government contracts are always awarded famously and or infamously to the lowest bidder. Wixon and Trisdale, when they came in for this 1947 contract, the work they would do in 1948, they were $2 million less than the next closest bidder. Now, $2 million in 1947 is the equivalent of $20 million today. And so the government had targets they wanted to pay per acre, meaning they wanted this job to cost X amount per acre to clear, and Wixon and Trisdale came in with this bid that was $2 million cheaper than anybody else, and they jumped on it. And you have to wonder that if how suspicious they might have been about this, because, again, this is the 40s, now the early 50s, if you will, and it isn't like you can do some big-time research on the Internet to figure out um, you know, how, how legit these guys are, what their background is. And it turns out they were incredibly legit, and they were, nobody had any reason to question anything. And they were coming in to do this job with an approach no one else had ever taken before. So as Reese was failing on a more traditional level of trying to clear this land, we start to see the Wixon and Trisdale method employed when they get on the job and start to do their work. They show up with their crew September 7th, 1948. They're employing about 150 guys at this point. Um, and it becomes very clear very quickly that these are guys that aren't here to mess around. They are going to make money, they're going to do this job, and they're going to outperform everybody's expectations. Because remember, yes, they were $2 million cheaper than the next bidder. You may think, well, how are they going to make any money? They're going to make it on efficiency. They're going to save cost by doing this job so fast, faster than anybody could have ever conceived it was done, and they're going to do it mechanically using a method that they had perfected I shouldn't say perfected yet. They will perfect on this job. Basically, what Wixon and, Wixon and Trisdale decided to do was to bring in a lot of bulldozers. So of the 155 guys that were working for them on this project, um, the majority of them were equipment operators. They brought in one of the largest bulldozer operations the world had ever seen at this point. Now, they weren't just there to push trees over with the blades of the bulldozer. It's way smarter than that. To start off, what they did was they took the bulldozers and they strung about 200 feet of 2-inch thick steel cable between them. And the guys would drive straight ahead, and this cable would just tear the trees out of the ground. It wasn't a perfect method yet, but they, they, act, they will work on this, and we're going to talk about how successful they were with it. But if you can imagine, if you take your, your fingers and make a U, kind of face your palm away from you, make a U with your index finger and your thumb, the ends of your two fingers are bulldozers, and all that space, that U-shape in the middle, is a giant steel cable, and anything in the middle of that steel cable with those two very strong bulldozers, Caterpillar D8s, pulling on it is mincemeat. And as I mentioned at the open of the show with that, that, that paragraph out of the popular mechanics story, um, it would knock these trees down like they were straws. It would They would take these giant hunks of forest and just tear them down like a lawnmower. And there were hang-ups. It wasn't perfect. We're going to get to that part in a couple of minutes, but let's talk about how good they were. So as we go back to Wixon and, Wixon and Trisdale, they started September 7th, 1948, and going back to our Bureau of Reclamation document for the history of the project, we continue. The outfit achieved better results and moved much faster than Reese. The area cleared by the firm totaled approximately 6,200 acres of mostly burned up area with dead timber. Reclamation made the contract deadline December 20th, 1950, but the company completed the job on August 18th of 1950. So think about that. Four months ahead of schedule, they're done. Now, the, 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 the smarts of these two guys, this is where they really come out. Not the fact that they did the job fast, not the fact they were done four months quick. They knew they were going to do that. But this worked so well that these two guys looked at each other and said, hey, as much money as we just made working together, we're going to make twice as much money by ourselves. So not because of anger, not because of jealousy, not because they hated each other. Wixon and Trisdale in 1950, or I should say in late 1949, they basically dissolved their partnership and went into, went into business independently of each other 
The reason is there was all these contracts to finish the work. The government was doling these contracts out um, on kind of a piecemeal patchwork basis. They didn't think anyone was capable of handling this job by themselves, so they wanted to split the work up into chunks of 5,000 acres here and 7,000 acres here and 6,000 acres there. Well, Wixon and Trisdale, once they got done with their initial 6,200 acres and beat the projection by uh, four months, they knew that they had the right formula. So they start bidding on the contracts independently. They're not stepping on each other's toes. I mean, clearly they're talking to each other and going in pricing-wise, you know, on the same level. There was probably some collusion there, but I don't blame them. Nobody else really wanted this work anyway. It was very difficult work. We'll get into that in a little while. But uh, it was very smart how they did it. So they bid on these contracts, and lo and behold, they get their they get the contracts. So they finish their job. Um, and August 18th of 1950, uh, winter is coming, um, and they they got to step up the program for the next year. So the two contractors bid; they win the contracts, and over the winter is where the is where the real smarts are applied for Wixon and Trisdale. There was one big problem with the method of using the bulldozers to mow the trees down, and that problem well, was two really. The problem was for smaller trees they would kind of like bend over and just flop back up again. The bigger trees, you know, the cable would catch on them and basically tear them out of the ground. Trees that, uh, uh, stumps were a big problem. And the, the problem for the stumps is, you know, these bulldozers in 1950 are fairly low to the ground, so you need a little bit of leverage. On a tree, the thing's so tall, the cable would ride up a little bit and it would just lever itself over onto the ground. But a tree stump being so low, you don't really have a lot of leverage to pull it out. And these are old growth trees that are really deeply rooted and they're tough to get out of the ground. So they needed a way to keep the cable in the air. And I mean about four or five feet in the air. Because if you kept it four or five feet in the air, it wouldn't catch on the stumps. It would grab the the, the small trees and tear them out of the ground just as much as it would the big ones. So how do you get that cable to maintain over the course of a forest in the middle of Montana that four to five foot height off the ground? The way they did it was to go to a, a metalworking contractor and have this guy build them a series of 10-foot diameter steel balls. And these balls, you can actually go find them. They are tourist attractions now. There's a couple of them in Montana. There's one in Redding, California. You can actually Google these things and go look at them. There's several of them left in the world. But if we can consider a 10-foot diameter steel ball that has an axle through the center of it, and that axle is basically solid steel, a couple-inch bar of solid steel running through the middle, Each end of that axle has bearings on it, so the big ball can rotate on the axle. And on the end of those axles is some massive logging chain, huge stuff that you'd find like on a ship. I would call it maritime, you know, anchor chain. And at the end of the chain is a turnbuckle or a swivel. And then your cable attaches to the swivel. So now you have this giant steel ball that's going to roll along, maintain the height of your cable. You're going to be able to pull these trees over going to be able to take care of business there you're not going to get caught up on the stumps it's going to roll right over the stumps it doesn't care and if you do happen to get caught up the operators of the bulldozers can use their winches to move the ball left or right so if something does get caught up a guy on the right can tighten his winch up a little bit and it would pull the ball toward him it would move around whatever the obstacle is and then you continue on your day you continue on your business Same thing if it had to go the other direction. That guy would get on his winch and tug the thing on the opposite side and get it around, you know, whatever obstruction that this giant 10-foot ball and your two massively powerful, very heavy bulldozers couldn't uh, couldn't move around. The other thing to think about in this process is these guys didn't even have two-way radios. It's 1950. No one's got walkie-talkies. They're hundreds of feet apart in a dense forest. They can't even see each other. So all this is being done by feel. Maintaining the proper distance, maintaining the speed, maintaining all that stuff, it's all being done by the feel of the operator with no real communication from the guy on the other side. And what I think is kind of fascinating about this is these guys got so good at it that they didn't need to talk to each other, that they could feel when that thing would get hung up. They could feel when that thing would get snagged on something, and they would just do their thing and move it and continue on with their work. 
The ball also had uh, several, I don't know if it's hundreds of gallons, several dozens of gallons of oil inside it. And that oil was there to splash around and slosh around and keep those big bearings on the end of the axles lubricated. So overall, the balls weighed four and a half tons, so 10,000 pounds of steel uh, is being dragged by the bulldozers. And you can actually find video of this process. Um, you can you can Google it. You can see the photos. You can find, again, the tourists' roadside attractions for <laughs> the big, giant, land-clearing steel balls. But to me, it's it's so smart. It is absolutely so smart. And we can talk again about how, how effective it was, but when you just the pragmatic thinking here, how do we solve this problem? Ah, we come up with a 10 foot diameter steel ball. That's going to save us. And it did going back to the Bureau of reclamation history of the project document. The two contractors started their new sections after the winter of 1950. They used tractors to pull eight foot diameter steel balls. They were 10 feet attached by cables through the trees and the brush. Workers used the balls to keep the cables clear of stumps left from logging operations. The balls also prevented the cable from sliding up and over more small, flexible trees. Workers soon named the process Operation Highball. The two firms combined acreage to clear a total of 14,695 acres. Both firms continued clearing operations through 1951, closing down in October for the coming winter, with approximately 15% of the work left to finish. Wixon and Crow finished the work September 25th, 1952, and Trisdale completed his section on September 30th of 1952. The dam wasn't going to open for another year and a half, and the job was cleared and done. And another perhaps telling story here about how difficult this work was, I continue. Coleman H. Dykes of Knoxville, Tennessee, received a contract to clear just 1,000 acres of the dam site on October 18, 1949. Dykes' efforts proved unsatisfactory in the eyes of reclamation officials. Dykes began the contract with low financial capital and no equipment for clearing work. Consequently, he got off to a slow start. Dykes let subcontractors, placed in quotations in the project history, apparently questioning their validity to several locals. By doing so, Dykes thought he had ended his obligations under the Davis-Bacon Act of 1931 that regulated wages on government contracts, including the requirement to file weekly wage affidavits, pay employees on a weekly basis, and to pay minimum wage. Evidently, Dykes' maneuvering did not clear him with the Reclamation Board because he finally led a subcontract to Robert E. Lee of Manning, South Carolina on January 25, 1950 to take over all of his scheduled work. The situation with Dyke's contract did not resolve for several months until Lee started work on the contract. Lee showed greater proficiency for the work, completing nearly 90% of the job and 52% of the time allotted. The firm resumed work after the winter shutdown of April 1951. The remaining job was primarily hand-picking and clearing of steep slopes. Lee developed a four-point iron drag shaped like an umbrella to pull cut trees to a central pile for burning. Lee completed his work on September 24th, 1951, and Reclamation accepted it in October. The point of reading that and touching in on that is the fact that another guy came in and failed because this job was absolutely massive. Now, Coleman seems like he was kind of a, um, how should we say it, uh, dishonest guy. Coleman was the type of guy that uh, didn't have any bulldozers, didn't have any equipment, and didn't have any real means to do the work in the first place. Seemed like he was trying to soak up some government money, and for him, he got his in the end. For our heroes, Wixon and Trisdale, it is time to kind of figure out the mechanical end of exactly what was happening here. How did they employ the machines properly? What were the machines they employed? And what was the horsepower that got this job done? Let's talk tractors. I am a tractor guy, have always loved tractors, and uh, continue to love tractors, and maybe that's one of the reasons uh, this story fascinates me so much, because of these hardcore dudes that were out running these machines seven days a week, 11 hours a day, the crews were out there, because that's what they had to do. you got to remember, we're in Montana, so when the winter shows up, work is done. You had a, a window of maybe six months of acceptable weather to get out there and actually get the work done, so it was imperative that the equipment employed in getting this 
uh, job finished was reliable, was strong enough to work, and certainly was capable of of doing the job. And they used some tried and true equipment. Caterpillar D8s were the most common bulldozer used, and many of you, if you're not familiar with heavy equipment, the Caterpillar D8 is one of the iconic pieces of heavy equipment in the world. The first D8s were introduced in the 1930s, right around 1935. Caterpillar continues to sell the D8 today. It is a Mondo bulldozer, and it has always been a Mondo bulldozer for its era, Um, and they've gotten bigger over the years like everything else in the world, it seems, but the Caterpillar D8s of 1950 had about 130, 140 horsepower, weighed 36,000 pounds, and had all the pulling power that these guys needed to really get the job done, especially with two of them hitched together with that steel cable. Now, one of the things to think about is the danger level of this job. And believe it or not, not a single person died during the operation of highball, of or I should say during Operation Highball. And I say that with some level of, of uh, authority because logging is very dangerous work. And a lot of guys died over the course of felling trees during the lumbering part of the Hungry Horse Clearing Project, when they were actually cutting the trees out to, to cut into lumber and, and railroad ties, a lot of guys did get killed, and unfortunately that was the nature of the business in logging. Um, I feel as though logging is still an incredibly dangerous profession even today. You don't have to spend an hour watching reality TV to understand that. You're dealing with huge forces, you're dealing with equipment that is very dangerous to operate, and uh, it was exponentially more so in the 1950s. So highball was very safe because of the fact all the work that was being done behind these tractors was happening, you know, 100 feet, 150, 200 feet behind them as they were just dragging this cable along. And the other thing that uh, that, that Wixom and Trisdale both did with their equipment was to weld uh, very large and strong steel roofs onto all their bulldozers. When you see photos of the tractors that were used during this operation, you'll see that they all had a roof on them. And that was not just to provide shade, that was to provide safety in in the event something fell on top of one of the operators. So they did have, they certainly had that uh, program under control pretty well. The Caterpillar bulldozers were, again, as reliable as anything that was ever built and continues to be built today. They also had a very large uh, Alice Chalmers HD 19. So the HD 19, um, was the big daddy of the, of the bulldozer world at that point. Um, the HD 19 was even more powerful, 160 horsepower. And this thing had a Detroit diesel engine, you know, 110 gallon fuel tank on it. It weighed 40,000 pounds, seven and a half feet tall, about 16 feet long and 10 feet wide. And they would use the HD 19s to my understanding, in some of the more, um, how should we say, difficult terrain, some of the larger areas of the trees, when they knew they had some old growth stuff they were going to have to uh, get get the job done on, they would definitely employ the Alice Chalmers there. If there was anything in the world at that time that could make a cat D8 seem small, it was the AC HD19, an iconic machine for its era, and again, an iconic machine in the world of heavy equipment, even today in 2020. And again, I'm going to quote here from our August 50, 19, or August 1950 popular mechanics story. Trisdale estimates that the two tractors with a ball and line can do as much work as a dozen cats equipped with only blades. Tui says it's a safer operation because the tractor operators are always far in advance of the timber that is crashing down behind them. A typical forest mowing machine consists of two HD-19 Alice Chalmers, a 400-foot cable, the end of each cable on a line or connected to one of the huge swivels, and from the swivel, 100 feet of one and a half inch line leads to the giant ball. Thus, as much as a thousand feet of line is available for the big loop behind the cats, with the ball to center the loop. Ordinarily, the two tractors now work about 500 feet apart. Each one beats down its own path through the forest, and the loop, meanwhile, pulls everything down between them. If the trees are too big or thick for this operation, each tractor can anchor itself behind a convenient tree or stump, and then the winch can be used to pull on its end of the line. This multiplies the pull and makes it possible to yank down trees that may be two or three feet in diameter. When all the line is winched in, the operators slack off and move their rigs ahead, then make another pull. 
this is just cool. I mean, it's blunt force trauma, but it's so cool to think about those guys in the forest just mowing this thing down. And again, if you love trees and you've made it this far in, I apologize that we're celebrating the destruction of a forest, but it was done for reasons that were good. You know, we built the dam out there and providing electricity. But what about the second part of the operation? When you have now taken all the trees down, now you got stuff just laying all over the place. You have 22,000 acres of trees that are just laying on the ground. What happens to them next? Well, you have to get rid of them somehow. And in the contract, it was basically deemed any means necessary. So they were not, the contractors that were clearing this land were not regulated on how they got rid of the trees. So you had a couple of different options. But the easiest and most cost effective one, which is the one that you would assume Wixom and, and Trisdale would use, was burning. And that's what they did. And so to burn this stuff, you didn't just set it on fire where it sat. You had to move it into piles and then set it ablaze. Well, this isn't like you're not just pushing straw here. You have thousands and millions, really, of trees that you need to move, you need to push, you need to shove, you need to get set up into these big piles so you can burn them down. And that is where the coolest machine maybe ever built comes in to the story. The Caterpillar D8 Twin. This was a machine, again, custom built for this job. And I quote from the folks at Peterson Caterpillar that they built this. This is a, a custom built machine from Peterson Caterpillar in California. And it was just uh, just really, really cool. So starting with two D8 dozers, the largest available from Caterpillar at the time, placed side by side with their interior crawler and final drive assembly of each tractor having been removed, a unique bar and custom plate were fabricated to allow the bolting of two tractors together using the inside final drive housing. A control system consisting of two throttles, two gear shift levers, two steering clutch levers, and one master clutch lever was implemented to allow operation by a single operator. Between 1949 and 1952, Peterson purpose-built three D8 twin machines. The first was sold in 1950 for work on the Hungry Horse Dam. The other two twins were built by Peterson were high-clearance versions sold to Holt Tractor. The first of these was delivered to King Ranch in 1951 and fitted for a Holt root plow and a funnel dozer to uproot 40-foot mesquite trees and stumps. The job that they employed at Hungry Horse for this tractor was they took a blade. They made a 22-foot wide blade that was tined. So rather than just a normal bulldozer blade that's just a, a curved piece of steel or many curved pieces of steel, this thing had teeth. And it was it was like a giant mechanical rake. And this rake wasn't moving leaves, it was moving giant piles of trees. Reportedly, this tractor was so strong that it would take 30 to 40 foot piles of trees and push them 300 to 400 feet into larger piles, which would then be set on fire. And at any point over the course of this job when it was going on, there would be the equivalent of three or 400 acres of stuff just burning. And this big Caterpillar twin... The, the, the two bulldozers bolted together. That's what this is. This is not a hot-rodded engine on one bulldozer. This is two complete bulldozers welded together with the inside tracks taken off. So all you have is the outside tracks. But when you see photos of the D8 twin, you will freak out because it is so absolutely awesome. Two, two operator seats, two exhaust stacks, two grills, two everything. One set of actual controls and the ability to do more work than any machine that had ever been devised to do. This was, for a very short amount of time, the biggest and baddest bulldozer on the planet. And Peterson only built three of them because, unbeknownst to Peterson and anybody else in the world, Caterpillar would introduce the D9 bulldozer in the early 1950s. So there wasn't, there was only a very small market in the first place that needed one of these, and then that market went away when Caterpillar actually introduced the D9, which was a purpose-built model that had about the same capability of this pair of D8s attached side by side. Pretty neat, though, that the job was so big and so worthwhile that they went to Peterson Caterpillar, and not only did Peterson say, oh, this sounds cool, they actually executed on it. And I encourage you to go to Google and look up pictures of the twin D8, because if you like heavy equipment, when you see a picture of this thing, you will, uh, you will absolutely love it. The job is going well. Operations going cleanly. Trees are being cleared. Uh, Wixon and Trisdale are making money because they are way out ahead of schedule. And 
everything that they have kind of come up and conceived has worked absolutely perfectly on this on this job. But what was it like to actually be out there amongst the 150 people that were kind of on the front line of this thing? What was it like to actually kind of do the work? Well, that's when an interesting part of this called life on the job comes into play. I think one of the neatest things to think about with this job is the fact that it was very remote for its time. Uh, Kalispell, again, Kalispell is only 20 miles away, but Kalispell is not, you know, uh, downtown Manhattan. It's a pretty small city now, and it was a very small city then. And one of the neat things that uh, Wixon and Trisdale did, again, just kind of interesting dudes. I wish I'd been able to meet these guys because they must have been pretty cool. They actually had a, they made an airfield, and they would fly a, a private plane not a jet, of course, because we're talking late 40s, but they had their own uh, company plane that they were they could fly back and forth with. Uh, the, the guys doing the job, I don't believe, were flying on that plane. It was probably management and or the uh, company ownership. But when we talk about what was life on the job like in the late 40s doing this work out there in Montana, it really was kind of old school in terms of the old style logging, logger life. There was no hotels to stay at per se so it became a good old-fashioned logging camp situation and again I okay, we look back at the project history here from this board of reclamation government document and this quote is is pretty cool a logging camp in the woods always can included a kitchen a blacksmith shop a barn and bunk houses frequently equipped with straw mattresses the kitchen in this case was a little log cabin with two log tables in it a stove or two, plus a counter for the cook to work on. The number of men the cook had to help him depended on the size of the logging crew he was cooking for. With a small crew of 6 to 10 men, the cook did everything himself. With a crew of 15 men, the cook could have one flunky. With a crew of 30 to 50 men, the cook could have two flunkies. With a crew of 60 to 70 men, the cook could have a dishwasher, two flunkies, and a second cook. How like 1940s, 1950s is that? Flunkies. They describe this in a, the government document uses the word flunkies. <laughs> you gotta love that. Lumberjacks often stayed at the camp for an entire season or at least for the duration of the work week due to the travel time to and from their homes. Better transportation by the early 1940s meant the logging camps became obsolete on many jobs, but while some of the men worked as loggers and clearing contractors on the Hungry Horse Project likely took daily trips to the job site, the vast majority reverted to camp life. Lloyd Fagerlin recounted years later that the Flathead area residents accounted for many of the loggers in the project, and they had the luxury of spending their weekends at home after staying in the logging camp during the week, some in portable bunkhouses and other in tents. Let's also address another interesting situation, the fact that you're clearing woods where wildlife has lived for thousands of years. This is not settled area that these men are working in. Living and working in the remote South Fork forest meant regular interaction with wildlife. The South Fork had always been favored by hunters, and some of the workers took advantage of the location to hunt during their time off. Wildlife could be a nuisance and a danger. Men recalled that garbage and food at camps attracted bears and created a challenge for the workers living there. He told me of one particularly bothersome night when a man at the camp became fed up with the encounters and ended up shooting eight bears that entered their camp in a single night. A guy shot eight bears in a night. Insane. Not all wildlife encounters resulted in a destructive ending. Charlie Shaw, who served as a forest ranger during the project, recalled a time when he was looking over the work with John Trisdale and the men spotted a golden eagle and nest atop a large snag in the middle of a cutting area. This is a great quote, and again speaks to how cool these guys were. This is quoting from the government document. Trisdale told his foreman to clear all around the snag, but to let the snag stand. All the brush was piled and burned, but the lone snag, with its nest of eagles, remained until the fall. When the young eagles had left the nest, Trisdale sent a crew back to remove the larch snag. To John Trisdale, this nest of eagles was of sufficient importance to alter the plans of a multi-million dollar clearing operation. I think that's great. I really think that's cool. A neat vignette. You know, it is kind of duality there, I guess. You know, you're ultimately you're destroying this entire area be, to make the reservoir for the dam. You're repurposing the area. And the fact that they had the humanity, at least in that moment, to go, hey, listen, we can come back and fix this when we're done. Just let the uh, let the birds do their deal and we'll come back and get it. And I think that's uh, 
that's a pretty neat, uh, pretty neat little vignette there. So the moral of the story here for me with the entire part of this mowing down the forest is it's, it's pragmatic thinking. It's good old Yankee ingenuity coming up with an idea no one else had conceived, this idea of that giant steel ball that was just dragged through the forest. And then not only using that and employing it the right way, but just killing it on the job. I mean, these guys beat their estimates on time by a mile. They made a pile of money in the process of doing it. And this was the introduction of a new way to clear land. It is not the only place this was used. In fact, it became a case study for land clearing operations around the world. And you can look at places like Rhodesia. Back in the 1950s or 1960s in Rhodesia, they built a, a giant dam and a lake. How did they clear the land? Exactly the same way these guys did it. You can find the videos. You can go to YouTube. You can watch them. They're in Rhodesia in the middle of Africa, and they're using bulldozers and giant steel balls clearing the land. The Vietnam War this was used in. You can go and look at footage from the Vietnam War when the when the the armies were trying to clear the dense forestry down to clear the jungle down. What did they do? Well, they hooked up bulldozers and they used steel cable and they used giant steel balls when necessary to clear clear cut, if you will, just rip down forests for their own defensive purposes and protection. So not only was this just a good idea for this job, not only did it make these guys very wealthy beyond what they already were, it reset the way that human beings did mass land clearing. And that's, to me, the legacy of those of those guys in this job. The fact that it was smart enough to make the cover of Popular Mechanics in 1950 says something. Because, you know, Popular Mechanics is still is a great magazine but back then this was a this was an incredibly well-read publication it was a very widely read publication and at the end of the at the end of the day to make the cover of that with because this was just such a smart idea speaks a lot to the legacy of Trisdale and Wixon I mentioned the fact that you can still see some of these steel balls and in the Redding area Cal, Redding California area where their original business was one of the balls is on display there. There is one on display at the Hungry Horse Dam site. If you're ever in the Kalispell, Montana area, and you're going to swing by the massive and impressive Hungry Horse Dam, you can check out that giant steel ball. The neat thing to me is when you look at these modern pictures of these steel balls, they're not all beat up and dented. I mean, they were they were made of some real heavy-duty steel. And how concentric they are for being how large they are and being how thick the, the plate steel used was, really pretty awesome. So there you have it, folks, the Dorkomotive story of the way the Hungry Horse Dam land was cleared, an interesting tale of innovative thinking and of how human beings continue to reshape the earth around us. Thanks for listening to the Dorkomotive podcast. Check us out on dorkomotive.com for more information, for more notes, and if you'd love to make a donation to support the show, you can feel free to do that there as well. Thanks for listening. We'll be back soon with another Dorkomotive podcast. <laughs>